my teacher told me to pick an evocative title for this composition. <laughs> so after a few minutes with Google Translate, I endeavored upon chanson caractéristique because I figure anything in French is evocative. <laughs> in reality, I picked this title because it means characteristic song, and I felt that the title suits the work. Personally, I view this piece as the culmination of my musical education up to this point. One aspect that really demonstrates this is that this work is in binary form. Um, I feel, sorry, this work is the first form, uh, piece in binary form that I feel confident about. And that's important because binary form is such a foundational concept in music. In addition, I also felt that this choice of string trio was an apt one for me especially, and that's because every previous successful composition that I've created has been for this arrangement. Perhaps this is because writing three-part harmony is easier, easier to grasp, or perhaps it's because balancing three voices is easier than four. Um, my name is Christopher Stubbs, and I hope you enjoyed uh, the performance. Thank you. Now we're going to grill you. <laughs> so what, is this the first time hearing this played by real instruments? Yeah. And how did it sound versus what you expected? Um, I felt like uh, the double stops were like, I don't, I don't know if that was a good decision on my part. <laughs> but, I, think it sound, I think it sounded good. So that's interesting. Cause I, I, like when you listen on the computer, I do feel like double stops end up sounding more full than yeah. when instruments play. But a lot of times, if just playing one note, you can focus your bow just on one note on one string, and it actually can sound just as full. It's kind of interesting how that works. Mm -hmm. um, I did have a question, a specific dynamic question, in measure 48. You can look if you want here. Oh. Uh, so, yeah. so we have notes of piano. Ooh, the cello coming with four. Is that is that just should that just carry for everybody? Yes, that's an accident. So so just fortissimo and then brought down the forte here. Well, I, oh no, sorry, no, actually that's not. Sorry, no, it is supposed to be fortissimo for the cello, but not for the other instruments because, like, I wanted to hear the accompaniment. Okay. A lot. Yeah. Let's try that and really try to to do it and see if you if you like the the result. It's, okay. it's an interesting idea. On the balance. So, but then, do you want do you want the cello to drop down to forte here, or just basically join us with a trip of forte there? Um, we'll just join you. It doesn't have to go down to the forte. Here. So, so, what what in, what in, what is the instruction? You're, you're going to just play exactly the dynamic. Play exactly, the exactly as written. And yeah. whole statements will be on. Okay. So let's start at forty eight. and question about the piece. Uh, what I like a lot about it is the, especially that section with the interplay with the da, ba, 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 where they're trading off the modes, which um, I thought was great. And then also there are these glimpses of moments where the viola goes below the cello and the cello like flips to the top of the texture, which I think are really nice as well. I, my one thing I think you could possibly do even better is to actually give a more extended melodic line to the cello or to the viola mm -hmm. um, at one point or another. And I'd be interested to hear how just the very beginning sounds just on the cello. If I could ask my cellist to the very beginning. Um, what do you mean? I, I just mean the, the melody line. Uh, she, if, in that octave, or do you think I should play it in a different octave? I think in that octave. I mean, it, you would have to obviously, Can you it, it wouldn't work right at the beginning, but just yeah. to hear. Yeah. I mean, uh, the bass uh, uh, yes. line. Okay. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> I'll play the field.
What do you think of that? Just an interesting it's option for did that sound next piece. different to you? It did. Um, yeah. I think that, yeah, they certainly had it. Um, <laughs> do you know Bear Clark and Uh No, I don't. There's the, I think in the, in the middle section with the big D major, he, that's the, the voicing is with the cello on top of the F sharp. Mm -hmm. It's what? So Sean Baird. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. You know the middle section when it comes in with a big D major lush sound. The cello is on. It's a very interesting. I, I like. I think both sound good, but it's interesting how different it sounds just yeah. making. It. I do think the trade-off comment is, you know, you're in, and I, I, I also really like the piece of that, especially in the phrase I love. The way that on the rest and then stop. That's great. Um, but training is, you, you can't ever have too much almost, you know. It, it creates, you know, with live musicians, it creates interest and interplay. And it, even if you write the exact same music, but you're trading ideas, it, it's, it's, it's never bad to explore that. So it's, it's a great, that's a great point. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to go back to that, um, that one's about 49, mm -hmm. that Fernando mentioned, where you have the cello written that doesn't work. <coughs> Um, the viola has an interesting line at that point mm -hmm. uh, for those two bars, and I I wonder if you're okay with that, with the attention being drawn from the viola for that, for those two bars to that bass line. So, and I know at 51 it makes sense for the cello to pop out. Yes, and it, I I would love to do it. Just I have like a bad habit of not giving the melody to the cello because on the music notation software, like, it never sounds good. <laughs> uh, I never want to risk it. Never okay. trust the music you gotta trust. software, yeah. seriously. Yeah. It's so a terrible, you... uh, can be, become a crush. I see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Can we try one more time, instead of doing that, she's yeah. gonna, what she's going to do, instead of dynamic, she's going to play with a lot of energy, but play the same dynamic. And see if that captures what you're what you're like. From the same spot for you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> but is it? But is what you want there? I think it sounds like. Yeah. It sounds equivalent to the original. I think that would be. That would work Perfect. for yes. what you're, yes. Yes. What you're talking so about. For, so, for the so, so, <laughs> so just from the cellist perspective, I played down about three dynamic levels. Mm -hmm. I kept the same energy. I think the staccato mark really gives out what you want. Okay. But when we see fortissimo written, we think you want us to play really, really loudly. Automatically, if I'm at the same dynamic as these two in that part, I would play down underneath, but I would also play punctuated in order to make sure that you hear that. Okay. So that would be how I would bring out the line. That makes sense. Oh. Yeah. Very nice. I think we are out of time. There's a lot more we can yeah. talk about. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay, next up we have Duet for Clarinet and Piano by Nathan Gell. Uh, Nathan is a student of Jordan Chase.
so yeah, so this piece I wrote it as um, kind of a, the duality between a very complex piano part and a simple clarinet and kind of those contrasting ideals. Um, there's not, I don't know, I don't have a very complex or reminded. But... So I have a question. Yes. Do you play the piano? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, somehow I had a guess at that. So, um, did you have any consult with what was your process, I guess, is for, for writing the piano part? So, just to give context to everyone, um, the piano part, as you heard, that there's some beautiful colors and chord changes, but the way it's written is basically impossible. So I had to kind of read between the lines a fair amount in terms of actually playing it. Because there's some parts that are just not navigable with, uh, with the hand, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, so I'm interested in getting you from how it is now to a similar piano part, but one that will have the same colors and beautiful chord changes, but that like, can be 10 times easier. <laughs> and yeah, so, well, yeah, yeah how so, you... so it was based originally on an eight chord progression, um, and then that was, I kind of just from there wrote um, just like fast moving lines of trying to establish like a um, it's like a general like baseline. It was not as much like just individual notes, but generally the like color and the tone of that key um, just throughout the piano line from that like fast moving line. So that cool. was, yeah, that was right. So I guess my main suggestion, because I think you could take this and and work with it and revise it and make it into a very beautiful and playable piece. <laughs> but what you want to do is, yeah, you're gonna have to. Just look at piano music mm -hmm. and listen to it, and then I dare say, like, e even if you can't really play it, go to the piano and like actually see how it's going to work. Um, and so what we can do now is like I can take the. It's, I'm not sure how useful it will be right now in the moment, but just so you can hear it, if I just try to distill the essence even more and try to play it uh, like in a way that's a little simpler, but that still, I think, gets your message across. Um, and then th the last thing to think about is, because you have the 16 notes going in the right hand the entire time, and then the left hand is a little bit more, it has this moving bass. Uh, I, I love, by the way, how it's usually not on the strong beats, or mm -hmm. often, right? It has yeah. an interesting rhythmic affect to it. Um, but if you could move the 16 notes to the left hand, at some times, mm -hmm. and then have the right hand maybe play the quarter notes or the long notes. Uh, I think that'll also add a cool dimension. Um, so before we do that, do you have any? Yeah, and are you a clarinetist? Also no. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. Um, yeah. So I mean, I think I think you wrote really well for the clarinet. Um, I don't really have much to say except just that the last from from eighty six right from I to the end yes. is just a little bit. Um, a little hard to digest, I think, mm -hmm. what I would say. Um, but, and so I would, yeah, I mean, I think you could achieve that same kind of affect by taking, even just having some eighth notes instead of just straight sixteenth mm -hmm. notes. Um, and like an, an interesting rhythm. You know, you have some some of those like da 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 Like that's really cool. And then da da da. You could add some more of that just to add more line to it. And, and mm -hmm achieve the same kind of movement, but with the rhythm. Oh. Yeah. Right, and so one, one very simple thing I can show you that, that makes the beginning very awkward. So from bar, measure one to measure two, there's actually a repeated note, mm -hmm. even though the chord, so it's it's written, the way it's written is, which already makes it like a, a notch more difficult, I think, than it needs to be to get just this, it sounds like what you want is this very placid and then like, very little swell yeah. would be much better. Yeah, yeah. just the double. Exactly. So, okay. so why don't we play? Um, well, let's see. Maybe let's jump to A. Okay. So, oh, let me just. So, yeah. Oh, I, I thought of another thing, but let's okay, do yeah. this thing first. Yeah, yeah let me just, hold it. No, no, say it, because I'm going to. Uh, oh, okay. And I also, it is just a little bit. It, it's. 
I think, and I, I'm sure this would come with more rehearsing it, mm -hmm. but it's also sometimes hard to know if I'm in the right spot, like okay. if that makes sense. Just because the... Just because, yeah, I think you, mm -hmm. since you do move a lot of notes on the less stressed beats, but it's, um, if you could have some parts where the clarinet and the piano are for sure together, mm -hmm. then I think that would give it some landmarks, yeah, okay. you know, yeah. some kind of structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's play it A, and I'm going to keep the chords as written and the bass line, uh, but kind of do a little more of this motion, which I gather you want from the piano part, but in a way that's yeah. easy, much more. So we're trying to A? Right at A, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Twilight uh, by my student, Alana Somfield, and um, it's for string quartet.
immediately change of tempo, or do you want it to slow down into it? Um, I wasn't thinking of slowing down into it. It was kind of going to be another kind of abrupt um, thing, but... Because the notes are held, though, it's not necessarily abrupt, because no, nobody knows what the tempo is until I play that. Yeah, I just thought it would note. sound nice if the, because the triplets kind of have like a rhythm to them, so mm -hmm. like slowing them down has that rhythm. Okay. I like, maybe I like the suggestion, like, um, because the natural inclination for a uh, string player is looking at it will be to slow yeah. down, you're going to want to write no writ. Yeah, not not to or something like that. Yeah. Do you guys all think it would be like sound better if there was? Well, let's do it both ways and see yeah. what you think. So maybe 23, I think. Do you want to just look through? Okay. So first way. Oh, yeah. First way, no, no rip. Second way, no rip. Yeah, I think... And I think the triplets are really leading to the... They're the, telling you that the tempo change is there if you slow down. Yeah. Otherwise, it's hard to tell that the tempo change just because of the right. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Anyone else? Oh, it's very nice. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, really beautiful. All right, we're going to be switching over to the adult part of our program. Um, so the next piece, it's two movements of a larger piece, um, and it's uh, Early Morning Sky and Afternoon Sky by Claire Rosser, and it's for our entire ensemble.
<laughs> I'm 80 years I'm old, guys. Right? <laughs> it's a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a hard, it's not like an uh, important question. I just asked for my own reference. And it's, you know, listening, and everybody who composes and uses computer software, we all know this, it's you have to try to not let it influence you. You have to try to think as much as possible how real instruments sound. And how do you do that? You go to concerts, you listen to a lot of recordings, and you think, how, look at their, you look at the score, how does it sound? Because computer software, I have Vienna, I have Vienna Symphonic Ensemble, which costs way too much money. <laughs> and it's still, it's, I mean, you know, it, it, it gives you a false impression of how things sound a lot. Like, for instance, that one. That note is clear every single time. That F, that F, that E is clear. You hear it in the speakers, you don't know. It's just, yeah, so that's a, it's, it's very important to remember that, that any computer sounds, whether sampled or MIDI, are not going to give you a real picture compared to real instruments. Yeah, it's hard for me. I play flute, and I've played with, you know Basili, yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. I've played with him a lot. So I think I write for cello pretty well. You wrote very yeah, well. Thank you. <laughs> that was silly when you say that. Yeah. Um, you know, and clarinet, you know, flute, I mean, the, I'm, I can always do melody. You know, that's easy because when you play flute, you're used to melody. It's the putting it all together that's been a challenge. But anyway. Thank you all. But a really so, nice combination. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a really great texture. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I thought it did. I love the cornet. Yeah. 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 You know, the whole thing. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. yeah. Next on the program is Triptych for Cello and Piano by George Cooper. George is a student of Sampos.
Okay. <laughs> Should I say a few yeah. words? Or? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't want to repeat what I said in the program too much, but um, I called it triptych, which is a word from the art world to describe like a painting in three, or a work of art in three panels. Um, and uh, it wasn't my idea to uh, apply this to music. I was uh, copying Puccini, who uh, wrote a sequence of three one-act operas that he called the triptych. And uh, I thought that was good because uh, I wrote uh, this piece in three movements uh, with uh, contrasting uh, moods. So the first movement is um, uh, more tranquil, uh, peaceful, uh, you know, major keys. Uh, the second one uh, is a little bit more fiery, uh, minor keys mostly. This one is, I just want it to be playful and fun and, you know, sort of goes back and forth between uh, major and minor. And um, thank you for uh, doing such a great job with it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just two of us and you study with them, so. <laughs> Time for um, feedback from me. Um, okay, so um, it helps that you study with Sam, who works with me. So I'm sure he gave you lots of good tips on writing for cello. Uh, but there's one thing with the harmonics. So we do fifth harmonics. Yes, they are physically possible. In this tempo, if you just take a look, um, that would be very hard to find. So what I did is I played a fourth harmonic. Mm -hmm. This one up here, I lucked out when I played it when I was on the career. There, see, that's how long it took me to find it now. I happened to play it right when we ran through it. Um, so that's, it, it depends on what you're going for there. So you might right. want to use two of those, just because of the tempo. Yeah. Uh, the fifth harmonic, that's what it looks like for a cellist of my size to play it. Yeah. If the C Lee's playing it, it probably doesn't look like that. So it depends on the hand size, right? right. That's why I would write it as a fourth harmonic because that's what we're generally used to. Mm -hmm. um, I have a. I have, yeah. Can I add oh, one more? Yeah, yeah, sure. We have a chord in here that's a really cool chord that also won't really work. Okay. Um, it's but it's like I just dropped the low F sharp here. Yeah. So I can play it. I have to roll my hand. So right. It's not going to be super, like, it's not going to sound really well. So, unless I play the top part right, or I play the right. bottom part, which also is going out of tune, apparently. There. So, that's what I would do. Okay. So, yeah. really small things. Um, yeah. Um, Couple of enharmonic enharmonic spellings that for somebody who's not mm. like practicing the piece. Yeah. For me, looking at it and playing it a couple of times, I was like, "Whoa, that's a big <laughs> surprise." But it's not really a big deal because you know if somebody's working on it, spending a lot of time with it, think, coming out with how they want to shape it. Um, but it, it, that's also something to think about in terms of how quickly it can be put together. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so, uh, got it. <laughs> so, so me and George worked together quite a bit, but what I actually noticed, because we played this piece last night and then we played it now, um, it, I feel like it wants to go a little faster, but then that creates problems at, toward the end when right. there's like lots of really fast rhythms, and that kind of surprised me um, because I actually noticed even just now I feel like we we tried to hold the tempo back. Maybe it was my fault, but I felt like it wanted to. Da -da -da -da. Naturally, kind of settles into this a little faster, but then when you get to that, it kind of um, becomes relatively tricky. <laughs> so I think it's um, yeah, I don't know if that's not necessarily a helpful comment, but because I feel like you you wrote it with this ending in mind in this somewhat slower tempo, right? That, that yeah. creates a dangerous situation where if later you feel like, oh yeah, no, it could. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Would it work like an hour gone, like like slow down, more dramatic at the ends? I mean, just play it fast and then slow down when you get to the big. Possibly. Are you talking about at 180 to the end, or? No, no I'm talking about more like. When we go into the. For me, the trouble starts around 125. Yeah. When you get to the top. Yeah. And then. And then I get these. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's any faster. 
faster. It's. Uh, uh, <laughs> I want to add something kind of um, sure. that is tangential. So I noticed that you put a slur plus a dot. I was actually thinking about that. I was going to ask if you didn't bring it up. Uh, it's it's one of those things that uh, I. Uh, struggle with a little bit more since I'm not a string player. Mm -hmm. I would, yeah, I was actually wondering if it would be better to not have the slur. I was thinking a pianist might interpret that differently uh, from a string player. But yeah, if that makes it difficult for the staccato to come through. What do you want there? Do you want... Or do you want... The second one. Uh, what I would do is I would... I, um, uh, us string players are going to balk at doing the slur because what happens is that at this tempo, so we have to lift up the bow, put it back on the string. Obviously, not this high, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at this tempo, that's going to be a bit of a challenge. Yeah. So, what I would suggest that you do is uh, probably I would have it be a slur for the first two notes, and then uh, we don't call it portato, but that's what I would put above the last note so that it would be like. Indicating that it's got a little lift, but instead of or <laughs> is that? I mean, like. So what what notation would be best? Do you think? What's that? What notation would be best? Uh, you so. It's just because it, to have it at this tempo with a lift every three notes is a little bit challenging. I mean, I would do two notes slower than keep the dot. <laughs> but he didn't want quite so much of a lift. That's why I was thinking of doing the dash plus the. Like that. Sounds great. Okay, so, <laughs> never mind. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so slur plus dot. All right. So, like, slur on the two notes. Two notes. Two notes like, if you yeah. start adding things like, like to or whatever, then well, straight like, what does he mean by Yeah, I thought you wanted it longer. Um, but the way I was, when I looked at it, that's how I would interpret it. Bernard was suggesting. So then you also have, um, in, you have a. So I think you're wanting to have long, short. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there I would put a, a, a tenuto mark on the down, and then a dot, but separate bows. And then two notes. That's much easier to play versus that's a yeah. little more awkward for us. Yeah. So little things, but um, and all this kind of stuff is very common for composers if they don't play a string instrument. You have to ask a string player. I mean, Brahms violin concerto was great, as I've said many times, because Brahms wrote it with Joachim. Yeah. If you go to the Library of Congress, you see Joachim's red corrections to mm -hmm. Brahms' mm -hmm. score. You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's no, it's no. Uh, uncommon thing to, to learn that way. All right, I think we're cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Next on the program is ARCs for clarinet, cello, and piano by Steve Mesner. Steve is a student of Sis McKay, who unfortunately has a cold and cannot be here today.
first thank you for playing my piece. Um, this piece from a process standpoint, this is part of a longer thing I'm working on, but from a process standpoint, instead of trying to write one long thing, I thought I would write some small things and stitch them together. Um, so this is part of that. Uh, and this is the first time I've heard it played, so one of the things I've learned over the years, uh, to Bernard's point about uh, the uh, playback on the notation software, is that the, I don't know what the, what the dynamics are really going to be until I'm in rehearsal. And then I can tinker, but since we didn't rehearsal, you know, as I wrote it, which, you know, I could hear things that I would change. So I have a, I wanted to ask if you have, you know, what, if you have any inspiration or models or what you were listening to, what was in your ears when you wrote this? You know, it started as a piano piece a few months ago and then I reorchestrated it last, last week or earlier this week, so I, I honestly don't remember. Are you cast? <coughs> Not a good one, but yes. Oh. <laughs> I noticed that your slur markings are pianistic. Uh, so when we see slurs of string players, we're going to treat those as bowings. Um, oh, I forgot to put in a note that it's slurs, not bowings. So well, so I mean, I automatically, I mean, I, I saw that like yeah. right away. I saw, okay, he has four bars for a slur. Obviously, I'm not going to put that on all in one bow. Mm -hmm. But if you want that phrasing, then my suggestion would be to put it in the bowing versus putting it as a group slur. Uh, so you can write legato and then have the, the, the slurring, or you, you could have it, it could be this, or, or, which I think is what I did, I'm doing like bar slurs basically, so I would group them like that, that that's going to be more, it's going to be closer to what you want than if you put the four bars, because then you're leaving more up to chance. I have a thought about, so it's hard playing the piece, I'm not sure who I should be listening to, what, like who is the main idea sometimes and who is accompanying. And I think one thing you can think about as you keep writing is think about how you can use repetition to kind of point us to the main ideas because the piece the piece unfolds very nicely, but it's hard to hear, like I don't hear how the middle part relates to the beginning and the end in, in such a way so, so that I can kind of grab on mm -hmm. ear-wise to like, oh, that's, that's the main idea from before, either rhythmically or, or a melody that, that kind of recalls what happened earlier, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I was trying to start with something and then move to a different place, so that it wasn't the the repetition that you might hear. Where I think it would, would have been helpful would have been different <coughs> dynamics. So it would have been clearer who was in the lead and who wasn't. So, but to that point, even when even you know in writing, if you're moving from one place to another, you can do that within the confines of an idea that kind of evolves and changes uh, in such a way that we still think or still here, like, oh, that's, I kind of recognize that from before, oh, but now it's different, and now it's in the other instrument, or now it's, you know, different key, different rhythm, yeah. I understand, I was trying to, yeah. again, do something different, as opposed to, like, the repetition of compulsion. Mm -hmm. the, the comment about the legato thing is interesting, because if I'm you, and not a string player, I'm thinking, well, how do I know how long to write? for a bow, like, well, how do I know, right? And the only thing I can think of, really, and this is what I do for instruments I don't know, is, you know, you have to study works by, by people who wrote well for those instruments, right? That's, that's the only way I can think, other than talking to people, right? Um, because you can write the long slur, and it, it works, but it is, it's always great when, it, when a player comes in like, yeah, this was written for my part, because then they don't have to interpret, they don't have to think of things, and I think, the, the next piece too, that there, there, are, there are no, I don't think there are any um, slur markings, so we, we have to interpret. And so we're there thinking, okay, what, wonder what the intention is. And if you know, then no, nobody will have to guess. So I think, again, I think it works, right? But, but it's just a, a thought to, 
you know, if you want to make sure to be specific. I think the bigger takeaway is that over the years I've been spoiled by having a rehearsal where yeah, these things get hashed sure. out. Yes. And we, we didn't have it here. So, you know, word of the wise. Absolutely. Yeah, and so then some of the takeaway from that would be at the end of that rehearsal process to make sure that you notate it in such a way that it can be replicated without you sitting there to explain things. Uh, so we are constantly interpreting, reinterpreting, like we're playing Bartok tonight. There are times when we're like, what do we think Bartok meant here? You know, so he's not here to tell us, so all we can do is interpret. But yeah, really, I, 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 I enjoy this. One minute. Okay. What, one quick thing is um, that there's a there's a fairly lengthy like direction in my part, which when I when my eyes see that and I'm as I'm playing, I'm like this is way too much information for me to digest as the music is going on. And so like going yeah the legato comment. And so I think just keeping and then as I'm like thinking about that, I also just think that. If you're accompaniment, it doesn't necessarily mean that it should be non legato. I think that that's, those don't really go hand in hand. And so then, as I was playing the part that you didn't put any slurs over, I'm thinking, I think that it just sounds a little bit dull um, and could be I mean, more um, legato. If you made it more legato, then it would maybe sound more song like, even while it was in the accompaniment. I hate doing slurs, dynamics, oh. all that stuff. And so well, embrace like, it. <laughs> Lean into it. <laughs> so I had this fun, you know, the battle throughout. Yeah, yeah. No, that, I mean, and that's fine, but I think a little bit, some different uh, articulation would be really. I mean, the fun part is writing it, and then there's yeah. the grind of the yeah. no, no. dynamics. No. <laughs> and then there's rehearsal, which is a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, thank you very much. Okay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs>
Hi, well, thanks very much for playing this piece. It's really interesting to hear um, something other than my computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is basically, I most of my musical experience has been playing fiddle in uh, dance music for in folk bands. And this is, was an attempt to bring my classical training into, uh, into that to sort of expand the expressive capacity and uh, just see what I could do with varying instruments and textures and things like that. And, um, I don't have too much to say. It was, it was short little sections because like with folk music, you, uh, you tend to write, first of all, you write with a choreographer most of the time. And each little section has a function, and you're usually progressing, moving groups of people through a figure where they, and so um, I've just gotten that habit, and I'm hoping to break it, but this is my intermediate point. So, it kind of reminds me of the theme and variations. Yeah. Like Are you familiar with pieces that have that form? Theme and variations, yeah. yes. Yeah, and was that? Your intent here? I mean, I heard what you said. It sounds similar, at least, to that kind of structure. Sort of, sort of that way. Yeah. 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 I personally love writing theme variations because it, it's, it's like you know, it kind of writes itself in a certain way because you write the section. As long as you have a good theme that that lends itself to variations, right? Right. So I like the contrasts and the, and the unity between the set, the sections. I thought I thought that was cool. So. Thanks. The, the title postcards of the spring rain. So I was thinking the variation. So each each one of these variations is like a postcard. Exactly, right. and um, I, I'm still just calling it spring rain or something. I wanted to sort of put in the fact that it was in the past. These are my memories. Yeah. You know, not immediate. You know, you're not standing in a spring rain. This is a memory of a spring. Rain. So I and I mentioned uh, for the previous piece too. One thing I I, I do think personally, and we'll see what others think. Um, writing at writing at the beginning legato and say that's going to apply for the rest of it. It's always better to notate everything all the way through than just getting a general instruction. Um, we interpreted this. We added slurs. We we added articulations. And of course, I don't know if you as the composer and listening to it being played by us. I don't know if you were thinking, oh yeah, I like what they're doing, or that's not at all what I thought. <laughs> Hopefully the former. But, you know, even if you want to trust the performer, I do think it's good to add articulations. In. So slurs at the beginning, if you want that legato, things like that. It's always good to add that stuff in. Right. I'm going to play devil's advocate for one second, because I... I, I she always does, actually. Yeah, we, we often uh, play the devil's advocate off each other. Um, what, what Bernard is saying is completely valid and um, I think important if that is the case that you want to convey a specific message. Um, Stockhausen uh, often did not indicate much and he really did want to leave it up to, in certain of his compositions, it was really up to the performer. But you might, if, if that's something that you want, which could be that you want to have it feel completely different, um, he sometimes doesn't even specify what inch whether there should be a specific instrument hmm. playing a part. So, um, but in that case, you would want to write something, you might want to write something beforehand saying, hey, look, you know, notice that there are no articulations, nothing uh, written right. here. I really want this to be left to the performer's discretion. Right. And then we can kind of put in our own thing with that in mind, knowing, okay, so we are following your instructions in a sense. Uh -huh. but, um, but that way we know whether or not you know, instead of guessing, like, is this what she wants? Right. I, I, that's partly my transition from folk music. We, when people are playing folk music, they just listen to each other and it just comes out, and it comes out different every time, and that's the way it is. And I think when you're doing something more complex, you have to take a little more control over it. Mm. And I wasn't exactly sure how to do it. You know, I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm interested to, to hear your background in, in folk music, and I think that thinking of these as completely separate 
kind of like things uh -huh. is maybe you can transcend that a little and incorporate more what you know and how you play mm -hmm. folk music into the next piece you write. Because I, I don't think I would have had much much like knowledge that, that you have a background in folk music just from listening to the piece. Uh -huh. I think you, you can incorporate, I mean, just taking melodies that you know and like kind of characteristic rhythms. It would be, you know, it would be a very different type of piece, obviously, uh, but just thinking of them as completely separate, like, okay, now I'm, you know, transitioning to classical. I mean, as you'll hear in, in the, like, the concert tonight, it's like this false dichotomy. I think you can work them together more, if you want. Yeah, I, I would like to. That's one of my goals. Yeah, it's kind of fun learning process. So when, you, when you're playing folk stuff, is one of the things that, that's hard different things you might do just purely from listening and hearing, knowing how it's going to work on the instrument, um, translating that to notation can be tricky. Yes, it is tricky. Um, well, something that was, for example, say I had you come in first and then you came in uh -huh. second with a similar line. Uh -huh. um, with the folk, with folk musicians, you would automatically know oh, she came in and you play softer. You know, you just yield yeah. to the obvious shape of the piece. But with this, I think, so should I write forte on his part, and that's a forte on her part, and then forte on her part. So yeah, that's a great thing. So it depends on the line. It depends mm -hmm. on the, like, if, if, if it's not clear, she might come in after me, but if it's not clear that her line takes precedence, let, let's put it this way, if we're playing a fugue, then uh -huh. each voice would get quieter when the next voice is they, oh, that's the subject, and now I'm playing counter material, so I need to drop so that the subject is clear. Right. Uh, but, but it's not always clear, so you have to think, is it clear that, that this material that's just coming in in the second violin needs to come out? Then you can write forte on that, and that's a forte on the first, if, it doesn't, if, if it's not really clear, maybe, to, to the player. Yes. Yeah. yeah. My... My one of my problems was uh, so say something comes in forte and then someone else comes in. Do you have to indicate the person's supposed to taper off, or will they just know from listening to the music that obviously? Yeah, like, so uh, I'll, let's take an example. <clears throat> Sixty something. Um, I come in and then she comes in. It's not, and maybe that's not an example of this. If what you're thinking, but. Like, I would definitely not think automatically that when she comes in, her line takes precedence. Maybe right. that's not an example of that for you. Uh, no, I don't think it this takes way, precedence. This would be an example of that. Yeah. When I come in, then I would drop. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so then this part, so is the movie. Yeah, part. and this is actually, and actually when I was playing this, I was thinking, I was, the last dynamic I had this piano, mm -hmm. and then you put a sports song in there. I like what you did at the way with the dance, like the computer can't. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But still, the only thing is, and, and I, when I got to here, I was thinking, oh wait, I actually have no dynamic indication other than piano there. Uh -huh. I took that sforzano to mean robust, but then I kind of took it as I'm forte, but uh -huh. there is no forte. So, so you want to put it actually a dynamic indication. Right. Some somewhere so that I know yeah. Sforzano is usually thought of as that's in the context. Yeah, no, I really like the way you punched that. So I will put a forte there and then you can do is you could put a diminutive, like a little hairpin down there. Okay. Or something like that. Uh -huh. Just in this case. And every case can be a little different, you know. Right. And I would yeah, put a Sforzano on her. Yeah. So that you get the same kind of Yeah, I have I'm sure I am looking forward to learning more about it. And again, I can't stress enough, look at look at quartets by Ravel, look, look at pieces by all of these. You'll see so many things, you'll think, oh, I wonder why they did that. Mm -hmm. There was a reason, and then you can learn how to, how to note, for notation. Right, you know? yeah. Because it's, it's complicated. Yeah. It is complicated. <laughs> it's also fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.
performance from Cassia. We're going to hear pieces by Sam and Bernard and improvisations by Sam and Susanna. That should be fun to check out. And then we'll hear Bartok's third string quartet. All right. Well,